Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling from. I'm calling in from Edmonton. It's a bright, beautiful, sunny day here. Uh, my, name is, my name is Elizabeth Callahayson. I'm Candy's Special Projects Assistant, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. So today's webinar is called Future Aircrew Training Program. CAE and CF Airspace have joined forces to form Skyline in order to jointly bid on the Government of Canada's Future Aircrew Training Program. The FACT program is designed to train all Royal Canadian Air Force pilots. Training shall be conducted in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, Cold Lake, Alberta, and Southport, Manitoba. As part of the FACT program, Canada has committed to including an Indigenous benefit plan to respond to the economic reconciliation with Indigenous people. As a Canadian company, CAE sees the importance of including Indigenous people in this program. To offer value for Canadians, the team is working to build upon the best practices of both companies' current programs, develop inno innovative and flexible training curriculum for future RCAF aircrew, and deliver the best in-class ITB results to the FACT program. Their vision is to work with both Indigenous organizations and suppliers to deliver the desired socioeconomic value to Indigenous people, thus building a stronger Canada for all Canadians. This presentation is about CAE and their leadership's vision to work with Indigenous community to build a robust IPB. Now today we have speakers David Ako and Abir Kazan, and I will hand the mic over to you and feel free to introduce you guys yourself. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, and I appreciate it. And Abir, it's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, just for clarity, uh, it's really Skyline <laughs> uh, that is formed together with CAE and with KF. Um, and, uh, and I've asked Abir to join us because she's working, class. she's the general manager, acting general manager of Skyline. So this is the person you definitely want to talk to, especially if you're interested in participating in the program. Um, but to level set everything, um, I want to just be, basically give you kind of like a literally, a, you know, a concentrated orange juice version of without any water uh, of what an IPB is. And I probably will not do it justice, but definitely um, uh, a beer can really talk to the ITB side of it, what it's mean, the industrial technical benefits and how that relates to an IPB or you're gonna, and I hate to use acronyms that much, but for an indigenous benefits plan. And uh, so without further ado, I'll just kind of look at it just to give you a lay of the land. Um, and you can see my screen, I hope. Ah, okay, you can see my screen? Yeah, okay, beauty. I'm just gonna move this over here so I can see you guys. All right, so so why be, and I was putting this on a why be on a, on, a, on a supplier database. And the supplier database is basically Main Street for, for, in, for indigenous businesses. This is where we hang our shingles. And in there, uh, being on a supplier database and being visible, uh, the corporate corporations like Skyline will be able to see you and what your capabilities are. So that's one of the important things. So how these things work together is that we have ISED, which is like the Industry Canada. They work with corporations. They set the ITBs, uh, you know, the uh, the requirements for the industrial technical benefits, and there's pillars for that uh, for the uh, for the benefits. Well, I'll go a little bit further, but inside of there, there's an, an Indigenous benefits plan, and the Indigenous benefits plan is a subset of the uh, you know of the ITB. But this is where corporations will be able to start responding to how they're going to work with Indigenous communities and just suppliers provide that value that government's looking for the socioeconomic benefit. So having said that, ISC in a different way works together and they set sort of the policy and work with uh, ISED or the Industry Canada and ISC being Industry, uh, Industry Service Canada because they have what they call the procurement strategy of a virtual business policy. So working together, they basically set, well, identifying the capacity, validating capacity, working with the uh, with Corporate Canada to develop those. And finally, PSPC is a me the mechanism that all this material gets pushed through uh, and turns into the requirements. So they'll end up on, 
request for proposals, you know, and in this case, it's fact, you know, um, uh, and then there's an ITB, you'll see things where there's an indigenous benefit plans. Normally, this goes to the primes, and the primes are, could be, and in this particular case, it's skyline because they have the capability to deliver such a program, and, but also when you look at the national shipbuilding program or any of the other defense programs where they'll have, you know, Irving or C-SPAN, but they will have to respond. So they work with getting those requirements. Why is this important? Procurement needs data. Okay, so data being who are the suppliers? Where are the you know where are the indigenous suppliers located? As you pointed out, there's three big areas that uh, uh, that the, uh, the fact is being part of. But what also you know identifying who is in the areas and who can supply? What are their capabilities? And most importantly, are they indigenous owned? And so certification is very, very important in this sense that they want to make sure that, you know, when companies like Skyline want to make sure that they have Indigenous suppliers. So uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Abir uh, and, um, and let her explain to you what they're looking for and how they really want to do this IPV. So uh, I'll stop sharing and Abir. Like actually, oh, yeah. do you mind do you mind keeping it for a second? I want to add sure, a little bit absolutely. of clarity for the team here. So um, if you could go back on that screen. So there is a particular um, slight clarification just for mm -hmm. to set the stage for everyone. Can you see it? Uh, yes, I can see it. Okay. Um, so within it's important to 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 know that who who's pushing from the government branches, the IBP is uh, certainly, PSPC is leading this. Uh, mm -hmm. From an ITB, ISET perspective, there is a, a, a very tight link with the IBP uh, with respect to uh, skills and development. So it's important mm -hmm. to understand that it's important. It's key to both government agencies that are part of the project office for fact. So um, I just want to highlight that it's... Uh, it's um, uh, nice championed, championed by PSPC, but very, very important as well by, uh, for ISED, yeah. just for, for clarification perspective. Okay, so no, no, perfect. No, that's a very, very important that there are drivers that are, are yes. out there. And just to give you a perspective on the drivers, where uh, Abir is talking about is in here, the skill development side of it and training which is new and it, they haven't rated it, right? So they're still working on what the scoring will be. If I understand you right, Abir? We, we do, we, as part of the draft RFP and even before that, the ITB is very advanced in the sense mm -hmm. that they define the rating and how, uh, how the evaluation is gonna be made. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to maybe the other part of the proposal, like the technical and the cost hasn't been as defined. Mm -hmm. uh, and the IBP also has been defined. Um, for the various pillars within the IBP, which we'll go over, there is a level of uh, points and maybe it's not in my presentation, but we can talk <laughs> broadly about it, but there are points for the various pillars and there is quantity versus quality, obviously, right? And quality is much more important, mm -hmm. right? And so there is a rating on the quality and then there is a minimum mandatory that will be established for the quantity for the, you know, how much percentage of the total contract value. Yeah, that's super. That's uh, that's great information to know. But I'm going to do a plug for another uh, session I'm going to have. I'm going to have Matt Streeter be joining us, and he's yes. going to be able to explain uh, from a PSPC point of view uh, how FACT is rolling out. So stay tuned. There's going to be stuff coming up like that. But in the meantime, I will not steal Abir's thunder. And, uh, and, let, and uh, Abir, feel free to take it away. Uh, okay. Yeah, perfect. So my presentation is more focused on the IBP. And um, I'm, at the beginning, it's about the company, uh, about Skyline, about CAE and KF and our, our team of uh, team of Skyline members, like uh, the, our chair one subcontractors, um, and then uh, focusing on the IBP. But I am very knowledgeable about the ITB. So if you want to ask questions and then connecting between IBP and ITB, I'd be more than happy to help. So, you know, uh, if I, if you find that, uh, let me know if there's information that you don't necessarily need me to focus on. I can move on to the ITB and IBP more so if that's what interests you more. So uh, like knowing that we only have limited time. So I'm going to share my screen.
I'm very flexible, so that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> I can but adapt. Great to know. <laughs> but, uh, I can adapt. So, yeah. do you see the presentation? Or oh, here we go. Yeah, no, you perfect. see it perfectly. All right, so I go in slideshow mode. And sorry, I'm looking at the screen, so you're really not going to see me on video very much <laughs> because I'm 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 looking at the big screen here. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, well, first of all, you know, I be, the, Dave, thank you for introducing me. I am Abir Kazan. I am the interim general manager for Skyline. Um, and I also am, um, as a part of my role, is to be the capture manager for this opportunity uh, to ensure that Skyline wins this opportunity and then executes on it. Um, so today we're here to talk about uh, indigenous benefits and uh, we at Skyline commit to the truth and reconciliation. Uh, by creating and maintaining long-lasting and beneficial partnerships with Indigenous communities across Canada. And we are doing so by uh, essentially providing opportunities to Indigenous peoples and businesses to participate and collaborate in our current operations and by working closely with the communities and the post-secondary institutions to leverage uh, existing um, <clears throat> programs for, for capacity or capability building um, to help reach the goals, you know, for such a big program, and we're talking about 25 year long lasting program, there's a lot of opportunities that, you know, uh, to grow. Uh, and, it, you know, actually, it's a generational program. So you mm -hmm. could have, you, you could be working on it, and then your kids would be working on it, potentially, you know, so it's really, it's a very important program for Canada. So moving on to the next slide. So Skyline, as uh, they, they've quickly mentioned, we CAE, I am, I come from CAE. I have 20 years of experience at CAE. I've been seconded to Skyline for the last three years, but CAE and KF joined together in 2018 to, to form a partnership, uh, which is Skyline. And Skyline has been um, uh, selected as a qualified supplier for the, um, for the future equity training bid. Um, and uh, we, you know, currently, if you look at what uh, what is FACT, FACT is a replacement program for uh, for all pilot training, uh, and we're to, we're talking about um, like really pilots, students that come that do um, some sort of screening by DND RCAF to define if they could be pilots or navigators or axon they've never flown an aircraft right that's like in essence they go into the uh what we call an ab initial training school so they go in they do various phases of training and then there's streaming to become you know uh, a multi-engine pilot uh, multi-engine uh, pilot like a c-130 pilot or c-295 pilot or a, a helicopter pilot uh, or become a fighter pilot on the cf-18 or potentially the future fighter uh, you know whatever future fighter program selection will be so really this is fact is about replacing all of the pilot and uh, and axo and asap training and axo asap is is really if you think about and i i'm sorry for the acronyms it's uh, it's all the guys in the back of the aircraft. So it's the combat uh, operator and the sensor operator in the back of, uh, of a you know, naval or tactical aircraft. And so we do, as part of fact, we will be doing all of those uh, training leading into getting graduates that goes to the operational training units. Uh, we currently, CAE and KF, we currently run the uh, NFTC and CFTS program. And those, uh, between the two programs, we we provide all pilot training for, for, for Canada. So we have, we're already the incumbent on, the, on a major part of the FACT program. Uh, so this, the contracted flying training uh, and support program is in Southport and the NATO flying training Canada, in Canada is in Moose Jaw and Cold Lake, Alberta. I wanna make a, a quick note of location for FACT is gonna be uh, Southport for, whatever we currently do in Southport. So it'll be multi-engine and rotary wing training. And then in Moose Jaw for all the basic flying and advanced flying to become a fighter pilot. And then in Winnipeg will be for the, uh, the folks in the back of the aircraft, the AXO and ASOPs. So Cold Lake is not, and I know we mentioned Cold Lake, Cold Lake is part of the current training programs, but not 
uh, part of FACT. So Cold Lake will be part of uh, another program to replace the fighter lead in training. I just want to clarify that uh, in terms of what, what fa where FACT will be. Okay. So KF is one of the parent company. It is uh, founded in 1970 in British Columbia by Barry, Barry Lapointe. It is the largest Canadian maintenance repair and overhaul provider. Um, you know, there's a lot of stats and I'm, I'm going to skip over some of the stats. You could see them on our website. Uh, I want to get to the IBP part. So really all I have to say here is that KF is the prime contractor for the, uh, for the CFTS program in Southport. And they also do uh, maintenance on the DND fixed wing star aircraft. On the CAE side, founded in Montreal in 1947 by uh, Ken Patrick. Uh, we are the well, CAE, uh, I'm part of CAE as well. We are a worldwide uh, leader in training and simulation for defense and security, civil and healthcare as well. For those of you who don't know, we have a healthcare division. Uh, and uh, we we train uh, internationally over 220,000 pilots uh, since uh, 2019. Um, and again, I'm like this. A lot of stats here. What it is important is we're uh, we're also the prime on the NATO flying training in Canada program at Moose Jaw and at Cold Lake. Okay, this, this is really our team for FACT, right? So we're working with a team of Canadian companies. Uh, we span, if you look at the map, we are all over Canada from coast to coast to coast. We're a truly pan-Canadian um, team. And obviously, you know, Skyline is the, the joint venture between the two parent companies, but the parent companies will, ex will execute as well part of the work. So CAE and KF would be as subcontractors sub to Skyline, as well as uh, ATCO, Blue Drop, uh, CBO, uh, Canadian Helicopters, PAL Aerospace, and Circle. And so you might know some of them because of the uh, extensive, for instance, ATCO has extensive relationship with the indigenous uh, communities and, and organization. And we are actually working, we are joined to the hip with ATCO when it comes to uh, the indigenous relations building and maintaining and then uh, defining the, the a quality solution for the uh, for the indigenous benefit plan for fact. So we're working, we're already engaging with the, uh, with the, the points of contacts that we we gotten from, from the government of Canada. And beyond that, we're going to the nations. We are connecting with businesses uh, that are affiliated with the, the nations. Uh, we are connecting with organizations, uh, institutions uh, to define skills and development opportunities and, and for, for upskilling, capability building, capacity building, uh, to meet aspirations or needs for the program. We have major needs on this program for employment and subcontracting. So ATCO is instrumental uh, um, in this and we're working closely and you'll see when I get to the point of contacts, they are really leading, championing this with us like for Skyline. This is a summary of uh, Skyline at a glance in terms of numbers, revenues, experience, and uh, you know, like location and whatnot. It is also available on our website, so uh, you could you could see all that data there. So I'm gonna go to the next slide now, and I will be showing a quick video on. Uh, mostly CFTS and NFTC with the, our experience. So it'll show some of the numbers as well. All right, so if I talk, let, let's quickly talk about the current program. So CFTS in Southport was awarded to KF in 2005. 
And uh, essentially, uh, around 80% of pilot candidates, uh, they receive their wings um, they graduate to the operational trading units uh, in Southport. Uh, on the NFTC program, uh, for those of you who don't know, it, it initially started, the program started in 2000, and it was contracted to Bombardier uh, Military Aviation Training. And so at, in 2015, CAE acquired that branch of Bombardier and in essence, became the prime contractor for NFTC and has been operating NFTC since then. So as I mentioned before, the two locations is in Moose Jaw and Cold Lake. Cold Lake is, is focused on the future, uh, on the fighter lead in training. So this is the part that I, is not going to be replaced in under the fact, and it would be a separate program. And hence, Cold Lake is not included as a location of fact. And that's like the clarity I, I made earlier. So future uh, fighter lead in training is a separate program and it started, it's in engagement phase right now. It started, uh, they have an industry day next week on this. Okay. So again, some numbers that you've, you may have seen in the videos, this is the amount of graduation or or we've uh, we've uh, generated over since 2005, and this is for KF on CFTS. Um, and those are the different phases of training. So the phase one is is done on a, on a group TP type aircraft. Uh, so it's really like the first thing you get into when when it's students who's never flown, they get into the phase one. Uh, training and then uh, they in um, in Portage they have in Southport they have uh, the multi-engine uh, aircraft as well so that's the phase three multi-engine out of there you graduate you become you go to the, the operational training unit and you become a multi-engine pilot and the rotary wing um, and we also do a lot of uh, qualified flying instructor training and refresher training so they need to come back and do refresher they come back on our site and and do this, these types of training. Same on the NFTC side, it's different phases of training. So NFTC is really focused on the basic flying training and then uh, the, the, the stream that leads you to become a fighter pilot. This is where the focus of that location. So the, all the phases of training leading up to uh, doing a few, uh, fighter lead in training happens in Moose Jaw, and then the fighter lead in training is done in, in, in Cold Lake. And those are some of the stats that we have since CAE uh, took over in 2015. And, and I guess, you know, quickly to tell you why we think, you know, we're best suited for this to execute on this major endeavor, major program. We are a truly Canadian company. We are founded in Canada, rooted in Canada. Uh, you know, we this is a com competition. Um, you know, there's another party who's involved in this uh, in this uh, opportunity, and the other party is is European. Uh, it's a joint venture uh, or partnership between Babcock and Leonardo, and so uh, th that's really our 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 edge, I guess. You know, we are truly uh, truly Canadian uh, training. Uh, we provide truly Canadian training. Uh, we're all over Canada. We're a pan-Canadian uh, uh, team. And as well, you know, uh, our team of, of subcontractors and company have established uh, relationships with uh, the Indigenous partners and communities. And we demonstrated a track record working with, with, uh, with uh, the Indigenous communities. Uh, and I think, you know, the other company has a lot of work to do to get to that level. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure they will try and you know, but <laughs> we'll see how successful they will be. Anyway, so <laughs> competition and, is good. Competition exactly. Is good. <laughs> competition is healthy. We don't want to be complacent, right? We're yeah. doing the best we can. So um, the the other thing to keep in mind is when you're a Canadian company, the profit stays in Canada, right? So as opposed to when you're a foreign company, yes, the the jobs are created in 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 Canada for for the steady state period. But when you're a truly Canadian company, all the profit stays. And then any innovation you do, uh, it's done in Canada, not necessarily outside and then exported to Canada or imported to Canada. Um, and so really it's all the benefits stays within to, to help grow our economy, our communities and, and, and build, build up our expertise even beyond what we have today. <laughs> 
So uh, this is this is just to show you. We have few pictures, like you you see. This is the first pictures in Montreal at CAE's facility. We had uh, the the uh, prime minister at our facility and the Quebec premier as well to announce um, a, a major project where both government invested uh, with CAE to to uh, to create an innovation program around obviously training and simulation and data analytics and artificial intelligence and whatnot. So this has been a very successful program. We have a lot of innovation that came out of it. This was this picture was taken in 2018 and we are able to use this today here in Canada and we could also export it. So this is the benefit of, a, a, like this is a, just an example of the benefit of a, of a Canadian company from an economic perspective. Uh, and then on the other side, you know, considering we are the incumbent and we are currently in operation and this is a replacement program, it, it obviously facilitates the transition. Uh, it's very important for the Royal Canadian Air Force that they don't have a dip in their training throughput during the transition period where FACT is ramping up and then NFTC and CFTS are ramping down. And so you need to make sure that you're maintaining that throughput between the two programs. And, and that's why we provide we provide a lower risk because we are the, in, the incumbent on, on uh, NFTC and CFTS. And also, you know, uh, for from your perspective as well, right? Like what really matters is that uh, because transition is critical and it's, it's a high complex environment, uh, nobody's gonna deny that. And it's gonna make it much more complex for the other company because they're not the incumbent. And what, what that says is that we will be able to Better work early, do earlier uh, work with with in partnership with the indigenous communities, and they will be focused on transition, right? Like they will shift their focus on getting it done, where we could actually have the right level of focus to work with you to help us help each other to execute this program during the transition phase, and then leading up to the steady state. We're talking twenty five years in total. Okay. So in terms of, uh, I wanted to give you a synopsis of the, the team's experience with, uh, in terms of partnerships and, and initiatives uh, to help, uh, you know, to work with the Indigenous communities to help in skills and development. I don't have all the details, to be honest, about all these programs, but we would be more than happy to get the right people to talk to you. So, uh, you know, ATCO, as you can see, has a lot of extensive experience, and it's not a full list. Uh, CAE, you know, is starting to get into that uh, more and more, obviously, uh, and we have more to more to work on. And Dave is going to probably help us a lot in that area. <laughs> and so we're we have a lot of uh, collaboration with the uh, SIIT on the current program, and we we will probably be doing more and we're collaborating currently with them for in terms of skills and development for future aircrew training. And we also contribute to the Inspire to help uh, Indigenous uh, youth uh, in, in the area of, of STEM, uh, science, technology, mathematics, and economics. Did I get that right? No. Yes, Economics and mathematics. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No. Okay, so talking about IBP, so when I said pillars, uh, those are really the pillars that you see in the Indigenous Benefit Plan. And uh, there is, uh, is going to be um, a, a mandatory requirement for percentage. Um, and it's probably going to be still worked on, the percentage of the total value of the program, OK? So that's going to be a mandatory requirement, OK? And then there is going to be a mandatory requirement for a certain level of employment as well. And then outside of that, there is the quality of the benefits. And the quality of the benefits will be scored using those pillars. So you know, how do you do employment, right? And, and how, how does the training and skills and development help you with employment? Like how is your approach to the approach to holistic, uh, you know, um, between those pillars, there's an intersection point and you need to make sure that you, you link it up completely. There's a big focus on skills and development because skills and development will 
help the other pillars, will help uh, employment, subcontracting, because you build capability and capacity with skills and development, you build for the future. So essentially, uh, I can't remember the points, but a big chunk of the point go to, to training and skills and development. Um, and um, and it's uh, subcontracting is quite important. So in terms of subcontracting, we're looking, we're gonna, I guess we're gonna be talking about how do we leverage the database that you have to help us uh, start reaching into the supplier base. Uh, we've already started with some, we probably need more. So uh, that is a very important aspect. And there's the equitability uh, that needs to be uh, demonstrated uh, so we need to talk about it in the proposal and how we approach equi equitability, but we also have to report on it during the program. So there is a linkages to the uh, points of contact that were provided by Canada that we need to establish. And, and ideally, it's, it's, um, uh, it's an equivalent um, split but it's not always as simple as that. And they, the Canada acknowledges it. So we'll have to work uh, on, if we deviate from that, we have to provide justification and, and then how do we offset to, to help with the equitability, right? So if there are areas that um, maybe don't have enough capacity then or capability, then uh, can we do more skills and development so that eventually, you know, during that 25 years, we can get to the point where, were more uh, balanced in um, between the various uh, nations and companies and whatnot. So it's kind of the uh, the approach we're looking at at this, but it's not uh, it's not a straightforward one to say that we divide the pie completely. Um, and so we'll we'll have to work with the communities um, and uh, uh, to to and collaborate to to figure out the right uh, the right approach on this. Uh, and then other measures is where you can innovate. Um, you know, what else can we do? Uh, you know, things like transportation, um, uh, creating specialized training programs for the indigenous communities or indigenous peoples, uh, or, or anything, you know, like career fairs and any, any other potential, right. That, you know, we may not think about or it doesn't fit in, in, in the other pillars, which would, would, would fit under other measures. Um, they, they, Canada has been very clear that the indigenous benefits is, is about fact, like from a, from a, from a, in a direct, it has to be directly linked to fact, whereas the, the beauty of ITB is that it can be also indirect. So this is where you could leverage the ITB um, in the sense that you could do things outside of fact, and we could get credit from an ITB perspective. We can even get multiplier from an ITB perspective. Uh, but the focus of the IBP is, is really on the two provinces, right, where the, where, where the program is being executed and, and on directly on the program. Um, Abir. Yeah. Can you take a moment to kind of uh, explain the difference between an indirect and a direct, you know, uh, uh, opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. So, so tip, what from Canada's perspective, and I guess it's it's the best way to explain it. Uh, so when uh, when as part of the request for proposal, we have uh, what they call performance work statement requirements. So it's actually it's actually the requirements of the program, uh, and anything that is covered under the requirements. Uh, the, so anything you would cost against the requirement, they would consider direct work, right? Anything you do outside of that. So for instance, if a skyline. Uh, invest in a skills and development program or a skills and development organization um, uh, institution, you know, that is considered indirect and it would be against the ITB, but it also uh, would be from a qualitative perspective be rated on the IBP. From a quantity perspective from an IBP, it has to be direct on the program. So, and then other examples for indirect is you could, you know, uh, we could create an R&D research and development program um, where we invest, you know, X dollars and, and then that program, once it's 
you know, once it's developed and we see that there is a, a deployability aspect that could be, it could be deployed on FACT or other programs, the actual R&D uh, research and development program is outside of FACT and that's indirect, but then potentially deploying it on FACT in the future as an improvement, that part becomes a direct contribution to FACT. Mm. Okay. Does that make sense, David? No, it makes total amount of sense. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. And in terms of indigenous opportunities, I mean, this is just a small list. There is much more. Uh, we presented this at um, uh, last week at a, another webinar. We had the competition right next to us, so we didn't want to give our secret sauce <laughs> <laughs> too, too much. So we were very high level, but there is... a uh, there is much more to, to be said on this, right? Like there is, but the, the point is every area of the program has a potential, right? Uh, so if you look at, there is, uh, there are aircraft on this program, there's, the, but, and hence we have maintenance and repair uh, that we need to execute on this program. We have all the aircraft, uh, airfield maintenance, site services, groundkeeping, uh, we also have professional services like HR, payroll, accounting, finance, project, project management, uh, project control, th those types of jobs or subcontracting opportunities would be available. Uh, and there's going to be, you know, a substantial amount in general on, on all those uh, areas. There's going to be a need for skilled trades and there will be a construction uh, needed. So just on that. Um, as part of, to make it fair uh, to the competitor, the project office uh, has uh, made a requirement to generate all new buildings in all sites. So despite the fact that you have existing buildings that could be leveraged, right, uh, because they don't want to interfere with the incumbent programs, they said, no, we're not touching the current buildings, we want new constructions. Uh, so there will be new constructions in, in all sites, in Winnipeg, in Southport, and in Moose Jaw. Uh, and it's not just a building. There will be more than the building where the training center, you have hangars, you might have a mess and, and, an additional, uh, additional, uh, uh, stuff and I, you know, I don't have the full scale of the design. I know I have someone who's working on it, but, uh, but certainly it's, it's a major endeavor. Okay, so there's a lot of work in, in that uh, area. It is a shorter term work because it's, it happens during the transition period, uh, but uh, there will be also upkeeps later on as well during the steady state and maintenance and, and whatnot uh, and upgrades to the, to the facilities. Um, we have to provide also air traffic control services, emergency services, fuel services, and and later today, but few essentially, uh, we can we 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 would be more than happy to provide a more holistic list. Or as we engage more in the future, we can certainly uh, share much more detail on that and see how we can help each other on that front. And so this slide presents the uh, points of contact. So mainly, so I would say that Tanya. Rexon, and I don't know if you've anybody has met Tanya on the call, but Tanya is championing this. She's coordinating all the meetings. Um, she's headed, she's spearheading all the meetings with the indigenous communities, businesses. Um, I am almost at every meeting. Um, you know, as now that I am also the general manager, it's a bit more challenging, but I try to be at every meeting. Peter Fedak is my Skyline POC as well. He presents Skyline during those meetings uh, to, to, to build and maintain those relationships. But certainly Tanya and Doug are leading the indigenous benefit and Tanya coordinates all of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, interactions and upcoming meetings and whatnot. And uh, I help her with uh, linking with other subcontractors and with the Skyline family to make sure that we have a holistic approach to indigenous benefits. So, and uh, I guess that concludes my presentation. This is uh, who we are. We have a website, skyline.ca. We are on social media. 
uh, you'll see a lot of the information I provided here on our website and social media. And we are looking forward to more engagement. It's, uh, we're, really, we're really happy to be here. I am very happy to be here and honored. And I'm looking forward to more, more, more fruitful conversations. Super, Thank thanks. You. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much, Abir. I, I, I'm like loaded with uh, a bunch of questions, actually. I'm looking at the presentation and um, uh, I'm really excited by, the, by this particular program. The fact that it's a, it's a generational program, uh, meaning that it's, uh, uh, you know, I can start in the programs and my kids can finish it. You know? <laughs> and one of the biggest challenges in the Indigenous community is to get the longevity of opportunity. You know, so um, so these these ITB programs or these large government pro generational programs provide that kind of opportunity, I believe, if for uh, for an indigenous community or company to sort of build into their uh, into their forecast or their training um, a multi year approach to growth. Yeah, so. Um, so that's one thing to consider, especially from the EDO perspective that's out there, because um, when you look at these programs, I would be jumping all over the generational programs if I was if right now in Winnipeg or, uh, or uh, anywhere around these areas. Uh, just want to have a little talk, a little bit, ask you, Abir, like, for example, there's three locations. Are you looking for... Uh, suppliers within those locations? Is there a distance? Is it, you know, you're pan-Canadian? Is there opportunity along along those lines? Or uh, how, how are you approaching it? So so if if I look at it from how Canada is seeing it, they are mm -hmm. focusing on the three region, three prov the two provinces. So anywhere mm -hmm. in the province, you know, so supplier in those provinces that are indigenous would certainly uh you know qualify as part of the indigenous benefits um now if they're outside of the um of of those provinces uh that would still like if they that would work from an itb perspective we could uh you know they could they would count as you know from the various pillars of the itb uh but uh, th there might be a, a link um, to be made to the IB. It's unfortunate that they did that. We've we've pushed mm. for nationwide. We we went back and said, why don't you make it nationwide? I mean, I understand that the focus is really um, in the two provinces, but we could. I mean, there's a lot of the transition uh, phase is done. Mm. You have you know courseware is done in Halifax, for instance, right? Blue Drop is in Halifax, so most of that that courseware development is in Halifax. You have all the companies that are doing development work, design work are all over Canada. They're not necessarily in Moose Jaw uh, and Southport. So we are pushing, we've been pushing, but unfortunately right now the situation is that the, the supplier base has to be, um, the, the benefit has to be to the provinces. Uh, so the supplier have to be in the provinces, uh, but it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that we cannot use suppliers outside of the provinces. That's uh, not where we're gonna stop, right? We're not gonna stop mm -hmm. there. Um, we're dealing with a, a company like Plato uh, and PQA, and I don't, I think they're registering in Winnipeg now. So, but aren't they based in, I'm trying to remember, they're, aren't they they're, based in Halifax? They, they, yeah, they're, they're in Nova Scotia. They're in uh, the, uh, you know, yeah. uh, in the round, uh, New Brunswick, I believe it is. Uh, okay, there yeah. you go. Yeah, so uh, through the Fredericton area. Uh, yeah, no, for, very familiar with, uh, with the company and even ourselves, like uh, we're based in Montreal. We're like down, really down the street from you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so when you, when you look at those opportunities and also when you look at, you know, Gunawage, which is here in Montreal, Gunasatage, which is here in Montreal, uh, and all these other opportunities. And just to let you know, Beer and, and company, we did have a, a session with the Manufacturing Association of Canada, you know, looking at yep. that and being able to build the manufacturing base. So these generational programs can, I know in this particular case with FACT, it's, it's not, but future programs when we're looking at uh, other defense contracting or other uh, ITBs where you have a generational program, you, there's an opportunity to create a manufacturing base, you know, mm -hmm. within the communities. Uh, one of the things that we have is uh, going for ourselves is land and people, fastest growing population. 
the fact that you can have um, more, uh, you know, communities have more control over their industrial parks and being able to develop those areas to provide. So uh, I, I think awareness around ITBs is pretty critical, which brings me to another question actually, uh, is industry days. You know, one of the things I thought there was uh, an opportunity where Indigenous communities can can really participate in, as like you said, right, earlier, it's too bad they did not include a pan-Canadian view, but if we went to the industry days, do you think we would have an impact in helping define those requirements where we can almost have a pan-Canadian approach? Yeah, and it might not be too late. I mean, yeah. you know, we've, we've pushed, we really pushed hard a few times, mm. and I, you know, there, the the, the draft RFP, just for your information, uh, the draft RFP came out in December uh, mm -hmm. 2020, and we've responded to the draft RFP in February of this year. Uh, now, we've had, uh, before that, a couple of iteration of the IBP, where we've provided mm -hmm. a couple of feedback, and we were consistent on... on um, you know, making it, make it nationwide, make it pan-Canadian. Uh, at the end, it was uh, very clear, like we had a specific individual from PSPC at one of the WebEx saying, no, it's going to be those two provinces um, and it's going to be direct on, on the program. Like we were trying to make it pan-Canadian and potentially include indirect because why not, right? <laughs> like the whole point is... <laughs> The whole point is that you wanna you wanna create benefits, right? Uh, that could at the beginning start being indirect, not necessarily mm. direct to the program, but in the future might actually be deployed on the program. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know if it's it's not too late. I I okay. think maybe coming from you uh, might you know if you talk to Matt Matthew. Yeah. Uh, and and discuss that with him you you know you might be able to get to a point where uh, maybe there are more uh, there might be other political reasons why they do this but 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 certainly we've been pushing and the the RFP is expected by the end of the year so there's still time to to do some uh you know uh I guess tailoring or mm. influencing but it's now it's like it's got to be now and I I would welcome that, David, like for sure, because you know, certainly, <laughs> you know, from our perspective, uh, we have the like a better reach than than the competitors uh, mm -hmm. within Canada, within and 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 we're already engaging with the communities. Of course, the engagement would be broader in this case, but uh, you know, it, it gives you a lot more, uh, you know, flexibility to do more things with Indigenous uh, communities, more things that you know. Right now, you're. You know, you're limited um, to steady state activities more so than what do you do with the transition when it's not in those provinces, right? So, yeah. no, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. I, I think there is a definitive role that uh, the, the national indigenous organizations have by participating in industry days. Um, there's more effort that needs to be done within the indigenous supply chain, the indigenous suppliers like myself showing up to industry days and saying, listen, we want to be part of this program. I'm based in Montreal, you know, or, or, or New Brunswick or Fredericton or, or even in BC. And this is the kind of role that we can play. You're absolutely right. Uh, but I think there's, there's an opportunity where, you know, as a group together, because I think when you, when you go to government and you say, well, we have these capabilities to go back to the primes, the primes are going to say, yes, we can use that capability. And then it sort of becomes a requirement because government feels comfortable enough to put out a requirement that they know that the economy can respond to or the supply chain can respond to. So, so Dave, to add to that, and I, and I think maybe the struggle is that they try to make it as fair as possible, mm. that they... <sighs> they may be trying to make it even for both qualified suppliers. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, they end up maybe uh, downplaying some of the requirements. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's why I say that, you know, coming from Skyline uh, might be viewed as self-serving because mm -hmm. obviously, and it, it is to a certain degree, let's admit it, right? <laughs> but, you know, coming coming from uh, from uh, from you folks, 
mm-hmm. uh, it's going to be seen in a different light for sure. And um, maybe heard. So, so the, the only thing that I would say is there's no more industry day, open industry day in that sense. Mm-hmm. Like what we call industry day for fact is really only with the qualified suppliers. So you need to find a different mechanism to oh, reach. And okay. I think Matthew is the right starting point. And then yeah. maybe Dennis, Dennis, Dennis mm-hmm. has been very integrated into the whole IBP. Chris Drouin from uh, from PSPC as well. He has two people as well working for him on the IBP. But certainly Dennis and Matthew are are the two uh, it's, people. It's I Dennis would Brenner, to. right? Is it Dennis? Yes. Brenner? yes okay. Yes. Exactly. Of course. <laughs> yeah. You know they're they're very instrumental. They're very open. Uh, those the real gentlemen. Real. And you're you're absolutely right. As an Indigenous community, we can go directly to government sure. and start having those particular conversations. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. I, uh, so I, I highly encourage uh, for those that are out there and who's going to listen to this recording to definitely work and work with the NIOs because the NIOs are the best or the, in the uh, national indigenous organizations I can do are, are the best representatives to collectively get that voice over to the Matt Streeters of the world and the Dennis Berners of the world, uh, you know, straight. Uh, so I think that's a very, very good point. But the, I also think there needs to be a feedback loop back to industry. You know, so mm-hmm. to say, listen, we we do have these capabilities, and we, you know, and we can influence these these indirects or these directs, or you know, even the requirements for capacity building. You know, and especially with the generational program. There's a good question that's been asked, and Jeff Prevo, and I don't want to lose it because this is very important. It's a good segue. Uh, it's like, how can Canadian construction companies uh, get involved? So this, in a particular case, PAR certified company, okay, but they're not Indigenous owned. And so I just want to talk a little bit about the joint ventures. Does, you know, uh, a joint venture being like you can tra- you can transform uh, through a joint venture making a digital company by having 51% owned on the shareholders, but the, the, the 51% is owned by someone who's recognized as an indigenous, uh, an indigenous person and willing to be audited. So uh, that's one way of doing it. What would be... Like, is that an opportunity when we turn around and say, I got a certified indigenous supplier, you know, along those lines by with a joint venture? Does, how, how, how's, how does Skyline view that? We, we are certainly looking at that, Dave, uh, um, mm. from, especially with, you know, in, in general, but mm. more specifically with the construction. So uh, we do have a preferred supplier for the construction, like mm-hmm. the top level, the general contractor and the engineering and architecture firm um, that they have. And, I'm, you know, they have a lot of ties as well with the indigenous communities. Mm-hmm. And um, and so the idea is um, to 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 get to that point where we can discuss uh, the, the the joint venture approach. We haven't gotten there but from a skyline perspective that's that's our strategy going Mm. in and having those discussions with the two companies um i cannot because we didn't sign up with them yet i cannot i cannot say who they are but i'm pretty Mm -hmm. sure you all know them uh and the idea is to uh look at uh do and they've done this in the past like those companies or at least one of them i know they built partnership and jvs with indigenous communities it's not strange to them it's like they've done this and i it makes sense and there's a lot of capability and capacity with the indigenous communities in in relation to the construction so it only Mm -hmm. makes sense right uh to do this uh and to build on it yeah So Jeff is informing us that he does have JVs with Indigenous groups. So I highly recommend, Jeff, that you you uh, that become visible. You know, make sure yeah. those Indigenous JVs are visible. Uh, again, on the databases and um, within the corporations, there's nothing that stops you from reaching out to Skyline directly and having those conversations and becoming visible. So yeah, absolutely. Highly- I would say if you want, like, reach back and and I could connect you with the the person leading the infrastructure, but also with uh, with Tanya uh, or directly to Tanya. We will con- we will make the connections, and you know it. Uh, you 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 might you know be a part of the team uh, of the uh, co- general contractor or the engineering and architecture firm. So that I'd be looking forward to all of that. Yeah. yeah. So, Abir, I'm going to ask you another question regarding um, uh, the, you know, the role of the the, the organizations like CanDo and uh, other other organizations as well. Um, does is Skyline's view do, uh, you know, 
be working with an, an, uh, an indigenous organization that's facing uh, economic development, is that a way to do, uh, uh, is that a way of being, um, facilitating you or working with you, making your life a lot easier by working with an organization that's sort of, uh, you know, aggregating suppliers to, to. I, yeah, I, I would say absolutely. I, you know, I, when you describe the whole process to me, Dave, uh, you know, and again, I'm, I'm learning a lot. So I'm really appreciative here. I'm pretty sure Tanya knows much more than me on this, on this aspect. So thank you. Right. Like I really, I'm, I'm blessed with this uh, to know more about uh, you folks, but um, certainly I mirror what you explained to me to the RDA on the ISET side, right? And mm -hmm. and the RDA, so region, what the RDA is our regional development agency, and they provide us as well, like because ITB and ISET have a lot of uh, small medium business uh, requirements and and then regional requirement, right? Like you gotta invest in in the various region of Canada, so they help us with the the supplier base, and that's extremely. We do industry days in their in their areas as well uh we get to meet the the companies so there is a lot of events that happens and i think you know uh it's it mirrors that to a certain degree mm. right so but it's more it's focused on the indigenous uh businesses for the 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 areas that we're focusing on i guess for now but it could be broader than that uh so it's it's definitely a, a big help right now tanya what she does is when she con connects with the uh, uh, with the First Nations and uh, some of the organization affiliated with them. Um, she requests, she does a survey, she asks them for information about the suppliers or partnerships that are affiliated with the nations. So she's collecting the data that way, but you know, it's, I think it would be very helpful to get that from, from to get a more holistic Mm -hmm. list of supplier so we've been able to connect with a lot of them so that was positive but i think they're you know there's jewel out there that we're not yeah. yet aware of right so yeah i i totally yeah i would i would certainly support that idea of like collaborating on and and getting to know more of the supplier base and whatnot yeah yeah absolutely and one other thing abir because because um capacity building is very much part of this and you know you got to reach out to with the employment agencies or organizations and so on and so forth yeah. so the national organizations i believe can really help build that catalyst as you're building up your ipb uh you know and your ipb strategy because the, of course government wants to have the most best socioeconomic program that's out there out of a out of a generational program like uh, fact you know uh, absolutely yeah. Jeff has a, a, another question, and this is more to, like he said, you already have a preferred contractor. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but, but the contractor doesn't do everything. They subcontract quite a bit. So I, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, there you go, Jeff. So yeah, get, you got to get visible that's, yeah. <laughs> and you got to have a conversation. So that, that's great. So um, I, I, Abir, can I just ask you to show those contacts again? If you yeah, just look absolutely. back to your last... And we'll just keep it on the screen for people if they want to take a screen capture uh, of those of the contacts on who to who to reach out to. So I'll keep it up there while people can grab a screen capture. Um, so I'll give. Uh, there's only three minutes left. Uh, I, I dominate the questions. Is there anybody out there that has any questions they want to reach out to uh, a beer right now? No. Okay. So um, I'm going to make a plug for the next uh, um, around. First of all, I want to thank Abir. Thank you so much for for um, uh, taking the time explaining, uh, you know, uh, the FAC program. It is great and fabulous that we, you know, we have uh, this opportunity to to you know to you know to reach uh, for the corporate Canada come reaching into the Indigenous community and and then and working as you know Indigenous Inc. For, uh, to be able to supply to corporate Canada to work closer with government. Uh, so we're really happy to do that. Um, and one last plug, Matt, uh, as we said, PSPC uh, is, is, is gonna be joining us. Matt Streeter is gonna talk a lot about fact 
Uh, I'm going to be scheduling it in June. So um, looking forward to be able to, and it's a continuation. You talked about the manufacturer. We talked about uh, OSME and uh, ITBs. Now we talked to a person who's working on FACWA. It's a real IP to ITB, but more specifically talking to government. So it's a bit of a continuity. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Thank you so much, Abir. Um, and meanwhile, we'll pass it back to, uh, to, to um, uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to Kandu to, for closing remarks. Awesome. Well, thank you for that awesome presentation. I hope you guys all enjoyed your time. Uh, this actually is going to be recorded and available on the website. And um, if anyone has any um, last comments or feedback, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. And uh, I have provided the can do links to learning for the upcoming webinars. If anyone is interested, feel free. And if there's no comments, we'll leave it at that. I hope you guys all have a great day. Take care. Thank you very much for hosting me, and uh, hopefully, we'll be able to talk to, to you soon. All right. We'll reach out. All right. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye bye.